Hello and welcome to the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. My name is Claudia Rizzini. I'm the executive director of the fellowship program. The Institute is one of the world's leading centers for interdisciplinary exploration. We bring students, scholars, artists and practitioners together to pursue curiosity-driven research, expand human understanding and grapple with questions that demand insight from across disciplines. You can be a part of this vibrant community by attending public programs such as this one, visiting virtual exhibitions, or pursuing the special collections held at the Schlesinger Library. To learn more, you can visit radcliffe.harvard.edu and sign up to receive more information on news and events. We'll begin the program with a presentation by Christina Davis. After the presentation, the speaker will respond to questions from the audience. Please use the Q&A feature on Zoom to submit your questions at any time throughout the program. We ask that you keep your questions brief to allow us to address as many as possible in the time that we have together. It is my pleasure to introduce Christina Davis, who is the Susan S. and Kenneth L. Wallach Professor at the Harvard Radcliffe Institute. We are very pleased to have Susan and Ken Wallach in the audience today. Thank you, Susan and Ken, for your generosity. Professor Davis is also a Professor of Government at the Harvard Faculty of Arts and Sciences, the Director of the Program on US-Japan Relations at Harvard, and the Co-Executive Director of the Japanese Journal of Political Science. She studies international relations and comparative politics with a specialty in uh, trade policy. Through examination of the interplay between domestic and international law, Professor Davis analyzes the conditions that allow for cooperation. She is especially curious about the politics and foreign policy of Japan, East Asia, and the European Union. Professor Davis is the author of two books, Food Fight uh, Over Free Trade, How International Institutions Promote Agricultural Trade Liberalization, and Why Adjudicate Enforcing Trade Rules in the WTO. Her second book, Why Adjudicate, studies the World Trade Organization, which oversees the negotiation and enforcement of formal rules governing international trade. Professor Davis exhibits that industry lobbying, legislative demands, and international politics impact which country and cases appear before the WTO. The book is the winner of the 2013 Chadwick Alger Prize the 2013 International Law Book Award, and the 2014 Masayoshi Ohira Memorial Prize. In addition, she co-edited Landscape of Law, Practicing Sovereignty in Trans Transnational Terrain with Carol J. Greenhouse. At Radcliffe, Professor Davis is working on a new book project about the politics of exit and entry into international organizations such as the United Nations and the World Health Organization. Nations joins such organizations to achieve technical co co coordination of, on certain issues and to strengthen relations with other countries. Engaging with historical case studies and statistical analysis, this book will study how the geopolitical context influences when and how states join organizations. Professor Davis aims to underscore the discriminatory practices over membership in multilateral institutions. Professor Davis is an alumna of Harvard College and earned her PhD in government at Har from Harvard. After teaching for 16 years at Princeton University, she returned her to her alma mater. And now it is my pleasure to give, give the virtual floor to Christina Davis. Thank you so very much. I am very grateful to have this opportunity to speak with you all today. I would like to first thank Susan and Ken Wallach for supporting my fellowship and the Radcliffe Institute for providing me a year to focus on my research and book project. I'm really grateful for all of the support, including that of the Radcliffe Research Partners, who in particular have been really great to support this research project. Emmanuel Kalibo, Mari Chen Fisk, Ali Jabari, and Sophie Welsh of the US Japan program have all contributed to my presentation today, along with summer research partners. That's really a wonderful group. This year has really been an opportunity for me to think more about a project I've been working on for many years 
joining this incredible group of Radcliffe fellows from filmmakers and writers to mathematicians and historians and all of the questions that you were asking have led me to rethink some of my own research questions and so it's been the conversations have stimulated me to think more about recognition discrimination and how maybe the politics of international organization is actually very much like citizenship in a country and how can these politics um, be contested. So this is a chance for me to present my research. I'm going to be talking about entry and exit, how membership in international organizations transforms international cooperation. And the project started actually in 2013 when I was thinking about how countries join international organizations at a time when we saw in the squares of Kiev of Ukraine, massive protests by people who were protesting a question of whether Ukraine was going to join a European partnership agreement or the Russian customs union. And they weren't really concerned about the tariff rates. They were concerned about, do you associate with Europe or Russia? And that actually was a big, catalyst to a revolution that overthrew President Yordakovich and led to, by June, a new government signing the European Partnership Agreement as an aspirational step towards membership in the Euro European Union. And of course, Russian backlash, intervention, and the loss of territory of Crimea. But this is the most controversial of membership conflicts of choosing sides. But even when there's no violence, in that same year, China was establishing the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank to show leadership, encourage more funding of needed projects in East Asia. The United States and Japan, leaders in development assistance, were critical and chose not to join. So these events bookmark how the questions of joining international organizations are not just about tariffs and loans. They're also about how countries choose to associate with each other. And the politics are often rivalry and geopolitics. And it's important to study these differences. And that is true even for organizations that aspire to be universal. We have in the midst of a pandemic heard the discussion about how Taiwan is not allowed to join the World Health Organization because it is not a member of the United Nations. Its requests in the past to join the United Nations or the World Health Organization have been rejected. And its petitions to be a participant as an observer have also been denied. And this puts at the forefront the question of who gets to participate in international cooperation. And now I have been studying this as a topic in a book about how states discriminate in their choices over who participates. Now, I started the project in many years ago, as I said, in 2013. And today I'm going to focus on chapter eight, defining statehood, exclusion from universal organizations. I've already looked at how the economic organizations really favor allies. And regions are often not defined just by geography, but by who is like-minded. But now I wanna talk about the universal organizations that say everyone is welcome, but at the limit make key choices. I will flag that fortunately the United States has stopped exiting organizations. So maybe I'll get to chapter nine and finish up this year, we'll see. I wanna talk about the discriminatory model of international organizations. I'll look at a big picture of over 300 organizations, the rules, then I'll look up close at the universal ones that say everyone's eligible. And how does it actually show up with patterns for allies are more likely to join? And finally, I'll talk through four of the really contested cases that we've seen where two states or two entities are competing over sovereignty. Joining organizations is really important. These organizations, are ways for states to commit themselves to uphold important economic, political reforms, regulatory standards. Investors pay attention. They have been shown to give higher bond yields to countries as they join international organizations. 
Other studies have even shown that states joining organizations together trade more and are less likely to have conflict with each other. Of course, the concern is that only friends are joining and those that share interests, or that the process of joining is screening out for only those that already change their policies. So it's really difficult to tell how do these organizations matter. And I'm going to focus on how the process of joining international organizations is not just about deciding, do you want to lend money or coordinate on pollution rules, but also who do you coordinate with? And that often involves favoring friends and excluding rivals. Because IGOs, international governmental organizations, are discriminatory clubs. We think of international cooperation as a global public good where the more the better, and we can't, you know, what we're pursuing is going to be available for everyone. But often cooperation can actually be excluded as in a club. And the key point I'm going to emphasize is it's not only that states want to exclude who gets the benefits of membership, limiting crowding, but they care about who joins. So it's not just, can you pay the dues? Can you follow the rules? But are you a state that we want to associate with? This is a case of non-anonymous crowding, which public choice theories have been discussing, but I'm looking at in the context of states to say that international organizations, if you think of a range of clubs, are closer to a golf club where you care about the socioeconomic status or in past days, the racial identity of members as much as whether they're qualified to play a good golf game. Instead of being a soccer team that might choose on your performance and whether you're actually going to help the team win. The advantage of a club model for international organizations is as the applicant, because joining is discriminatory, if you get in, it's status and peer effects. So yes, the investors will think more highly of you. And for those who do get in, they can decide the criterion of who qualifies, whether it was the 19th century European standards of civilization or the shift in the 1990s where being democratic was important and a consistent criterion on geopolitical alignment that states that share security like to help each other join organizations together. But it doesn't look like security backbenching politics because it's all in the name of multilateral cooperation, laundering these influence attempts. At the same time, these decisions about recognition are what form the international society as states that regard each other as subject to the same rules are members of society. For the universal organization, this is you know, beyond the European Union that is for a fixed region. When you talk about a universal organization, the charters do claim to be providing environmental goods, peace, cooperation, health, where everyone will benefit. And the more participating, the closer we will get to that ideal. These are universal organizations. At the same time, they are the gatekeepers over sovereignty, that elusive status of the citizenship card of being the state. And yet what is sovereignty? We hear the word thrown about a lot. It is a complex subject that doesn't have one dimension. In part, it is control over your domestic political sphere, the ability to exclude other states from interfering in your domestic sphere, and yet, you sometimes invite interference because you want to achieve greater cooperation. And so it's very difficult to define what is sovereignty. And in effect, membership in international organizations becomes one of the key pathways. Because what is a state? Seems simple. One of many treaties that tries to define the state, the Montevideo Convention on the Rights and Duties of States, says that a state is something that has a permanent population, a defined territory, a government, and capacity to enter into relations with other states. How do you go from that definition to 193 countries that are members of the United Nations? Well, allocating statehood is difficult. 
You could be among the group of victors after World War II who joined the United Nations as part of the conference founding the United Nations. You could be a state that later gained independence and joined through accession. The UN Charter Article 4 lays down the criterion that the United Nations is open to all peace-loving states which accept the obligations contained that in the judgment of the organization are able and willing to carry out these obligations. Now, they have to submit an application. The Security Council, including all permanent members where the United States, China, Russia have a veto, must recommend, and the General Assembly must approve by a two-thirds majority vote. So here's where the politics come in, and we may see deviations from an abstract objective definition of what is a state. Many organizations have conditions like the United Nations, some form of expectation that a state that applies for membership has capacity. So we might think that, you know, you have to have some control over the economy, operation of the public sector. Most organizations expect statehood to be evident in terms of legal standing. Of course, if you're a UN member, that is one gateway into having legal standing, but recognition by other states is another pathway. And political ties, because many organizations do have voting. And so your political ties can help your entry into organizations because others will want to share benefits with their security coalition or use the benefit of membership as a carrot to reward their allies. You can see this through many ways of measuring political ties, alliances, embassies, those who share aid. Now, this is a picture where I'm gonna start showing you some of the data before I get into the case studies. Looking at 325 international organizations of a wide range from the Organization of American States and the European Union to the World Trade Organization and the United Nations. Most organizations are selective. 87% have some form of selection process. There are very few that just let everyone join in. And of those that are selective, many do so through eligibility. You must be in Europe. You must be a producer of oil for OPEC. So we have eligibility restrictions. What I'd like to draw attention to is that a very small number, less than 12%, actually review the compliance of an applicant's laws with the rules of the charter. So the idea that you have to show on the books you're complying in advance is not in practice that common. So today I'm going to talk about the 65 that say on the eligibility dimension, all states are welcome, but then have some form of selection. The inclusive ones may say states can sign up, at most a majority vote. Some are more stringent. They require a two-third vote, including often a veto and sometimes a consensus vote. Here you can see that since 1865, we've seen an increase in international organizations. And here I'm again just focusing on those that say all states are welcome. They're now up to 65. They may claim to be open, but they don't achieve universal membership. Some are very high the United Nations with 193 members. Others are very small. So the OECD with 33 expanding as they add new members now, European Union adding and subtracting members. So we do see, of course, sorry, I mentioned the EU, it's not open because it does have a regional restriction. But there are many organizations that are open and still have less than half of the potential states actually join. I'm going to look briefly highlight some of the statistical analysis where I step back and look at all of these organizations, all of the potential 164 states that at least have some data statistics on their economic size and whether they have alliances, what is their type of government, so that I can look at what are the correlates of membership. You know, to what extent is it rich countries, democratic countries, those with an alliance with current members, that are more likely to join organizations. And I can do this with statistical analysis that is looking at the control variables and the rule of how much does the alliance matter in terms of your alliance with other states joining the organization or your alliance with the biggest member of the organization, which usually is the United States, but depending on the organization can change. Statistical analysis here, I won't talk long, but there is a positive statistically significant relationship for alliances with joining organizations at the start when they're formed. 
joining later when they expand. And this is true even if I control for within a state over time, as they add alliances, they're more likely to join. Or within an organization, those states that have more allies with other states are more likely to join. So this is just showing there's a correlation in the big picture that security seems to matter and help states join. And you know, it's small and a state that is above average in the number of shared alliances, you know, is going to have a 0.5% increase in the likelihood of joining any given universal organization. This is actually a larger effect when you look at the subset of 16 organizations, the United Nations and its specialized agencies. So if you thought the UN was safe from politics, no. Diplomatic ties have a cor positive correlation when we think about embassy relationships. States that have more embassies tend to be also members of more international organizations. But this goes both ways, and I'm having a hard time parsing out because for some states, they get a lot of embassies before joining, others join and then take off with their embassy recognition. We can see some outlier states here that have a few less embassies as pariah states or those that are denied recognition. I wanna talk through the cases though, because really it's when you start looking at individual countries that have contested membership, trying to join universal organization like the UN, that you see how politics, not the definition of what is a state, determines when they join the organization. And Korea is one of the most, um, archetypical examples of how geopolitics shaped when they got to join the United Nations. 1945, the end of Japanese colonization of Korea led to a call for elections. The South of Korea holds elections establishing the Republic of Korea and the government appeals to be the single representative of Korea. But the Democratic Republic of Korea in the North does not hold elections and the Soviet Union vetoes the right for the South to represent the entire Korean people. And so we have contested membership here where you have two appeals, both seeking to be the representative of Korea, the United States vetoing North Korea, the Soviet Union vetoing South Korea, both governments contesting. And for a while, every year, this came up as a major debate. They actually, by the 70s, start to join some international organizations. The South government was able to join the World Health Organization quite quickly. The North started joining in the 1970s for some other organizations. But the United Nations remained elusive. And it was only with the start of Glass, um, Glasnost and Perestroika, where the Soviet Union relaxes its own views about geopolitical rivalry with the United States, reaches out, and of course, as it establishes better ties with the South, and there's a key summit meeting between President Roe and Mikhail Gorbachev, where they basically reach an agreement that South Korea should be allowed to join the United Nations and that the Soviet Union would not block its membership. Key point though, because the North Korean government was still objecting, was when the Chinese government also reaches out to the North saying they have decided not to block the South from joining. And that gets the North to resign that this is inevitable. And so both sides agree to seek dual representation. And finally, by 1991, you see North and South represented even while they both still hold a goal of unification. Two seats with a goal of unification. Here you can see in the case, as I mentioned, embassy representation, legal status, actually was starting in parallel and both countries were getting some recognition and had embassies in most countries, even while they were still being denied seats at the United Nations. Once they get that 1991 membership in the United Nations, for North Korea, if anything, they're switching to be more of a pariah state. Countries can use the UN as their form of association with the North and the North likewise, while the South continues to expand its position within international society. Now turning to an even more difficult case, a case where there's one state, but its government had such an appalling human rights record with its division discriminating against its own people, 
that many other governments felt this regime could not represent South Africa as a sovereign nation, a representative of the United Nations. And so here, instead of two governments rivalry over a seat, we had the case of a sovereign nation that was seated at the United Nations, but was not accepted as a member of international society by a large share of other states. And the question of, can you exclude a state to expel it from the universal organization, to stop it from joining other organizations because you do not recognize that that particular government over population territory is qualified to be a state. And this was in part denying the benefits of international cooperation that come from membership in international organizations as a coordinated sanctioning effort to shame and oppose the apartheid regime of South Africa. So it reached, started in high intensity in the 1960s, as we start to see more newly independent states in Africa form coalitions, joined often by the Arab states, the Soviet Union and China to reject the legitimacy of the South Africa regime. And that shifted the balance in the appeals to expel South Africa regime. There were several critical resolutions that South Africa's abuse of its citizens through the policy of separation and denying rights to colored people were against the spirit of the International Labor Organization or cooperation for world health or for distribution of standards for education development, even the Universal Postal Union. And so we saw critical resolutions and votes to expel. With the expulsion of South Africa from all of these organizations that do aspire to be universal. In the case of the Universal Postal Union, the Congress would vote to expel South Africa, but because any UN member could sign on to join, South Africa re-entered, and then it would be expelled again, and then it would re-enter until finally this game stopped. And for a while, for about a decade, South Africa remained outside of the Universal Postal Union. Although their postal general did say that the postage would still be delivered and there was not going to be any decline in the mail services. What is important here though, is that the votes about expelling South Africa were also about sovereignty and geopolitics. And so we do see Cold War rivalry where the United States was supporting South Africa in the fight against communism. Proxy wars in Angolia, Namibia were being fought and South Africa was seen as a bulwark. And so when the United States and the United Kingdom defended the sovereignty of South Africa in the United Nations or in these other organizations, there was a sense that it was both the sovereignty and the Cold War rivalry. At the same time that we saw the Soviet Union and China among the most vehement critics of apartheid and South Africa's representation in international organizations. And indeed that postal general in South Africa saying that when they were expelled, they would still be able to deliver their postage also pointed to the fact that the Western Bloc had voted to keep South Africa in the Universal Postal Union as an encouraging sign. So we do see the sign of political alignment in the politics over who supported the way to chastise, expel South Africa. And yet those rivalries ended not only with the end of the Cold War, but the end of apartheid. Once we have Nelson Mandela released from jail in 1990, the negotiations to bring an end to apartheid, the election in 1994, immediately the South African government is invited and joins back into international organizations. You can see these patterns where diplomatic ties of embassies were kept very low as countries tried to distance themselves from the apartheid regime. And with the change in apartheid immediately, South Africa being brought back into international society, both at the international organization level and with the expansion of embassies it hosts and the embassies that it sets. Here we see the international organization membership of South Africa. 
the red line for South Africa shows that compared to peers on the African continent, it was at a higher level of international organization memberships in the 1950s. But as more countries that opposed the apartheid regime gain a larger share of the membership of international organizations, they push for its expulsion, they stop it entering as new organizations are formed, so that during that flat period from the 1970s to 1990s, South Africa is not joining international organizations. While Egypt and Nigeria are clearly continuing to expand their role in international organizations. So this is just showing how the exclusion effect is quite evident for South Africa. And then the release once you have the end of apartheid. Now I do want to get before we end the last two cases of the most contested international organization controversies, Taiwan and Palestine. Taiwan, of course, it, we're actually coming up this October on 50 years since the decision that the representation of China at the United Nations would be held by the People's Republic of China, which in effect denied the representation for Taiwan in the United Nations. These decisions also switched for the UN affiliated agency, agencies, as well as many other organizations over the coming years would switch membership to the PRC as the representative of a one China policy. Many states also rescind their diplomatic recognition. And so Taiwan is a state without state status. Even as its economy thrived, even as it attracts and sends students around the world. We can see that this controversy over representation is one of the most contested. There have been different paths though, when we think about how does Taiwan represent its interests in international society. It has remained a member of something like the Asian Development Bank, continues to be a representative. China joined the PRC, both are full members of the same organization. It has been renamed Taipei China in many organizations as part of a compromise to have two state recognition. We've seen parallel entry. Both states joined the World Trade Organization and APEC. But the universal organizations have been the most difficult for this contested sovereignty of Taiwan, where as the government is trying to shift its policies, it has faced the opposition from China. Since early conversations that Taiwan should be allowed to join the World Health Organization. In 1990s, it starts to try and seek membership. Finally, in 2007, we see a full application from Taiwan to join the United Nations and the World Health Organization. This was not accepted by the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. The United States behind the scenes said this was not a good step and it was never brought to a vote. But as the government in Taiwan shifted back to a KMT government by President Ma that sought to use Taipei China and participation, not membership, China became more approachable and allowed for Taiwan to get participation in the World Health Assembly from 2009 to 2016. So this was a step where Taiwan could get its voice in the room while not having full membership. But that compromise fell apart with the democratic election, shifting who was the elected leader from the KMT rulership to the DPP rulership and President Tsai was seen as less favorable by the Chinese government and the request to participate in the World Health Assembly have been blocked. The United States has strongly encouraged that Taiwan should be allowed to participate when statehood is not a criterion. For example, the World Health Assembly. We have seen Mike Pompeo, when he was Secretary of State, make strong views that the US and European governments should support Taiwan's membership and participation in international organizations that do not require statehood. There is a strong bipartisan consensus in Congress behind this sh shift to advocate for Taiwan's participation in international organizations. But ultimately, 
the Chinese government has a veto over the United Nations and is willing to put hard politics when these votes come up so that a majority is not in favor and we are seeing the difficulty that Taiwan faces. Even in the midst of a pandemic where Taiwan has stood at the forefront of a very strong response to establish good policies to control the COVID pandemic, to share PPE with other countries through high production, and yet the difficulty for cooperation remains large. Here you can see in the big picture as Taiwan is not a member of many international organizations, indeed, small micro states are going to have more international organization memberships than Taiwan, even though it's among the top 15 international economies. Here we see Palestine is another controversial case that I will briefly talk about because truthfully, we would take months to try and debate all of the ins and outs of Palestine's rights as a candidate for statehood and the problems that are raised when it seeks to establish its right for statehood. On the benchmark of a government that represents a territory and a people and that has recognition, we can see that Palestine is not rich, but it certainly has a higher economic stature than some of the UN members. Diplomatic recognition is actually very strong with 138 states recognizing Palestine and most states, including the United States, calling for a future goal of statehood. But when it comes to membership, controversy begins. Palestine tries to join the United Nations UNESCO, which is committed to education, science, cultural organization. It's an open universal organization. The United States cannot veto because you do not need the UN Security Council recommendation. Palestine has been trying to join universal organizations since 1989 when it first applied to the United Nations, the World Health Organization. It has been denied at the United Nations repeatedly, but in 2011, on a coalition with support from Russia, China, Arab states, and building support from many European countries through its commitment to negotiations in the peace process with Israel, Palestine won the majority to gain membership in UNESCO in 2011. But this was a divisive outcome. We see the United States saying we support the aspirations of Palestine to achieve statehood, but we believe that it should be done through negotiations in the two-state process with Israel. The United States has legislation in Congress that requires defunding any organization that gives membership to Palestine. And so once UNESCO gave membership to Palestine, the United States and Israel cut their funding after years as a member, but not funding, they lost their voting rights. And then finally, under the Trump administration, the United States withdrew from UNESCO to exit the organization itself. Now, this does show there are some limits to major power gatekeeping over sovereignty that the universal organizations do come down to an appeal and politics can be played on both sides, forming coalitions to establish political support for statehood. And the coalitions allowed Palestine to join, while to date, Taiwan remains on the outside. Here you can see that vote in 2011, clearly following lines that countries that are generally more distant in their voting with the United States on a range of issues in the United Nations are the most likely to vote yes for Palestine to join UNESCO. And those states that voted no denying Palestine's right in UNESCO are also the same states that tend to be very close to the United States and vote with the United States on a whole range of issues. So again, you see this like-minded foreign policy alignment shaping the politics over Palestine. But ultimately the opposition of the United States and Israel was not enough. And as a member of UNESCO, Palestine has been able to gain rights, it has expanded the organizations that it is trying to join. And yet, it also has had to have restraint. During the COVID pandemic, it thought of again applying to join the World Health Organization, but decided against this because of the recognition that if it joins, the US will defund the organization. And Palestine as a non-member 
receives many benefits where the World Health Organization provides health for the world. And so they decided not to push the case to a vote. In conclusion, international organizations are serving as discriminatory clubs. And the discriminatory club decides what is the standard, whether it is forming security allies, whether it is excluding the states that are not legitimate representatives of their people. And even in the universal organizations, we see this moving benchmark of what constitutes a state qualified to contribute to peace, prosperity, and good health. And through this politics, international organizations are allocating sovereignty. Now, this can increase cooperation by building more like-minded states who are more able to cooperate without contested sovereignty. At the same time, there are states that are very qualified to contribute that are denied participation. And so if we were to think about a criteria of capability to meet the rules of the organization, we might have come up with a different list of states. Thank you so much. I look forward to questions. Thank you, Christina. This was uh, very, very interesting. Um, as you can imagine, given current events uh, in Myanmar, we do have a question to start with, uh, with that. And the question is, how can international organizations respond to the overwhelming calls of protest there? Yes, we do have to consider international organizations have a membership that provides an umbrella for the sovereignty of a state. And there are challenges if every time there's an election or a coup, we expel the state because then you lose the stability of participation. And so there is this challenge of when you have a coup that brings a government into power that you don't want to recognize, you may pull out your embassy, you may refuse to meet the leaders who you do not think are a just leader. When do you withdraw their right to sit as the representative of that people? The representative of Myanmar spoke to the United Nations criticizing the government and was fired for that speech. At the same time, to date, we have not yet seen a movement to expel Myanmar's sovereignty by excluding it from the international organizations. Instead, there are efforts to pressure it and there may be use of the international organization forum to pressure these leaders to change their policies. Um, and, but I think it does um, bring to bear one of the most challenging issues that we face is what is the right for a state to participate and should there be a criteria of democracy? But many governments that are not democratic are fundamental if we want to achieve a goal, a goal such as world health, environmental protection, we need to have China in the room. So we cannot suddenly establish democracy as a criteria for participating in an organization for peace and the environment and good health. So my own thought is that with Myanmar using the fora for a place to socialize, to criticize, to condemn, but not it's impossible and would be dangerous to have a complete criteria of democracy as necessary for participation. Right. Um, so what is your suggestion, looking at, back at uh, um, the last two cases that we you, you analyzed, so what is your suggestion for Taiwan to join the international community? What other avenue are available? The government of President Tsai has been advocating for more participation, which allows for participation without forcing the vote on full membership as a sovereign state. And I think the goal here is to establish its ability to get information. So we can think in the COVID crisis, actually looking back in 2003 during the SARS crisis, Taiwanese people were dying of the first round of this pandemic and not able to get medical advice from the WHO. They sought desperately to improve their access. The same thing happened now with the COVID crisis. 
And even not being a member of the International Civil Aviation Organization has been a problem as airlines were coordinate, coordinating on how to deal with travel restrictions. And Taiwan is not allowed to get the same information. They have to get information through other states that share what is going on and the very rapid pace of regulatory change in the midst of a crisis. So I think it's a practical step when Taiwan says it will try to expand participation and there are difficulties about what is the price of status in terms of gaining access. We can also say that as a non-member, Taiwan has done very well. Their response to the COVID pandemic has been excellent. Their airlines are doing fine. And so maybe this also does show that what really does um, matter is also the status of getting sovereignty. And so we can hope that after many years of participation, other countries will join a coalition of support that there is a reason to have a new debate about whether if Taiwan as a entity can stand alongside China in the WTO, is there also some compromise that would allow, would allow Taiwan as an entity of some kind to stand alongside China in the World Health Organization in the coming years? Absolutely. Um... Um, thanks for the great presentation. <laughs> From your point of view, what would you consider a major disadvantage of international co uh, collaboration? <laughs> yeah. Yes, well, it does um, have its costs. So governments are experiencing backlash that, you know, I do a lot of work on trade policy and study the World Trade Organization. And we see in front of us that many people in the United States and other countries are starting to wonder if this globalization of the economy has been such a great idea. And rethinking whether bringing China into the World Trade Organization in 2001 was a mistake. Because when you agree to low tariffs, then you were accepting the rules and organizations don't always enforce full compliance. And so sometimes there may be a fear that you will be complying while the other is not, and you lose flexibility. Mm -hmm. Similarly, when Britain decided to exit the European Union, there was a sense that ever closer union and common regulations with Europe was not the vision everyone in Britain wanted. They didn't want the fear of every health standard being set by a common regulatory agency. And so that pushback of sovereignty versus coordination is really deep. And as organizations get stronger, they require more voluntary compromise of sovereignty. So it's ironic that joining the organization proves you're sovereign, but as a member, you have to follow rules that are set by a big group, even when sometimes you might think I want to raise an arbitrary tariff on China because I think it's going to help my national security. Well, that breaks the rules. So that's the cost of joining these organizations. Right. I guess following up on, on, on your answer to that question, the following question is, how do you see the future of international organizations with the rise of bilateral efforts between nation states? as was seen in, recent pandemic, in the recent pandemic where international organization and multilateralism were bypassed. Yes, bilateralism can seem efficient. It's the multilateral process takes time and compromise. And so again, I studied the trade organization and we've seen that since 2001, they tried to reach an updating of the rules for trade digital economy, they couldn't reach agreement. Whereas bilateral agreements or small group agreements go forward and you can have the US, Canada, Mexico establish new rules for e-commerce or the US and Japan can establish a bilateral agreement that just gets things done. So that's cooperative. Maybe that is necessary for some issues, but it risks leaving behind the toughest issues where you need a big package where if we were only talking agriculture subsidies, you would never get agreement because there are such clear winners and losers. But if you talk agriculture and manufacturing and e-commerce and intellectual property rights, maybe everyone sees 
enough benefits to sign on. And that's the same climate change. There are going to be some who will see more costs. And if you only negotiate one rule, it's harder to reach an agreement. Whereas if you put together some of the benefits and costs on a couple of issues with more states, you're more likely to achieve the goal of helping to come up with creative solutions for improving our climate and helping to share the costs of that adjustment and peer pressure enforcement to make sure that you're not paying the cost while someone else cheats. So I do believe that multilateral cooperation ultimately is the path to getting a larger share of states and those tough issues where if it were only two, you might leave it aside and never get around to solving the problem. Mm. Yeah. Um... The next question is, how does the balance of power between domestic actors within the US change the exit of intergovernmental organizations? And does it matter who is in power, which party is in power? Well, it is interesting. The, um, the <laughs> studying the exit and entry of international organizations during the Trump administration was quite a challenge because of course, there was a lot of rhetoric against multilateralism from the Trump administration. And so we did see a particular anti-multilateral focus. And that is true whether it was withdrawing from UNESCO and the World Health Organization, even the Universal Postal Organization, the Paris Climate Accords, a range of issues. And yet I don't think that is a Republican partisan position. And so we have in the tradition of American politics had a strong bipartisan support for building up international organizations. And so from that post-war Bretton Woods Accords in the 1948 window through the 1980s, bringing to an end of the Cold War, there was really strong bipartisan consensus. And even now we can say the Trump administration brought pushback against multilateralism. Now we see the Biden administration trying to restore those, you know, back into the World Health Organization, the Paris Climate Accord. And so I do think that that is, you know, the democratic administration is strongly multilateral but many in the Republican party will also be supportive. And on a particular issue like Taiwan's participation, there's incredible bipartisan support on keeping Palestine out of the United Nations. There's incredible bipartisan support. Hmm. So uh, the next question, it seems that the, um... The Palestine case, uh, Palestinian case, is one of the most blatant examples of the discriminatory club at work. Why has US, the US made discriminating against Palestine such a major policy agenda? The speeches by US government officials have been pairing commitment to the organization and the aspirations of the Palestinian people with saying that it is not productive to pursue UN and international organization membership first, but that the priority must be through the negotiations with Israel and after achieving a recognition of an agreement with Israel, then should come international organization membership. And that has been a bipartisan consensus. And so we do see democratic or Republican administrations taking this position. And very strong speeches by Susan Rice under the Obama administration at the time of the 2011 UNESCO vote letting Palestine in, at the 2012 recognition where the UN General Assembly by a large majority voted to give Palestine non-member state observer status. And on that vote, the United States was one of a small handful to say no. And most states said, yes, even if we don't think we're going to let Palestine have membership because the US is opposed, it should be recognized as a state. 
And the politics here do come down to US domestic politics and US international politics that the Middle East peace process must be Israel-Palestine solution. Um, and so it's a combination of domestic politics and votes. We all know there are a lot of votes on issues of where you stand and support on these issues and on the international politics of how to solve the Arab-Israeli peace process and achieve peace. Mm. Uh, there is a question about sovereignty uh, and we began with the, a statehood definition but identity, by, uh, but identity politics portrayed across the talk has revealed a reality of club dynamics. Do we need a new definition to contrast against geopolitical, geographical uh, statehood? This is a good question. And this is where, as, as I'm coming to the end of the book, I still struggle with this idea of what would be the right criteria for entry. And in political science and political theory, there are these deep debates about the fit between a government and its people, and what determines this relationship. And we examine the process of selecting leaders and whether it is democratic processes. When you go to the international context, what is the way to determine the fit between a state and international society? And should it be a vote or is there some other definition? And right now we have a combination of votes about some common view with some states vote being weighted more heavily. I would like to see a real discussion about what would be criteria we could agree on in an objective sense and a committee that could evaluate applications. But you cannot have statehood or citizenship by committee. So it would come back to votes. But it would be interesting if you could come up with criteria that everyone could agree on. Because we do see states that flip, where China would be strongly in favor of Palestine gaining membership in the United Nations and strongly opposed to Taiwan gaining membership, as other countries have also taken two sides of some of these different contested membership debates. If you were to actually come up with a criteria of what level of representation of a public and representation with recognition from other states is valid. And we could actually add in more criteria for compliance with the rules of the organization and get more cooperation. Because sometimes the backroom politics are letting states get in really easily without having to change their policies very much. If we were to add a more rigorous screening, you might get countries not only paying their dues, but changing more policies in order to show a committee they had one membership approval. So I would hope we could have some combination of objective standards as well as approval because it is an international society. It's not just a check mark of a list of criteria. Absolutely. Um, thank you, uh, Christina for uh, clarifying for us some of the international dynamics that we see at play every day and for your thoughtful perspectives. I also want to thank you, the audience, for the terrific questions. I hope you'll be able to join us for other Rackley virtual programs. You can find out about uh, future programs and watch videos of past events at rackley.harvard.edu. Thank you again for joining us today. Have a good rest of the day.